Hello and welcome to this lecture on the trace minerals. We'll start by looking at copper. The primary function of copper is that it plays a role in your immune system function. It promotes blood clotting and lipoprotein metabolism. It's a component of your blood and it's needed by enzymes for them to do their job. One interesting thing about copper is that if you take very high doses of zinc for a long time, it can actually reduce the bioavailability of copper. So one of the things that zinc does is play a role in wound healing. Sometimes in clinical nutrition, when people have decubitus ulcers or bed sores, which are different types of skin breakdown, the medical team might prescribe supplemental zinc in order to help promote wound healing. The zinc helps promote wound healing. But the zinc intake is usually limited to something like 14 days because too much zinc can cause a copper deficiency. Sources of copper include things like liver, legumes, seeds, whole grain breads, and cereals and cocoa. When it comes to the needs for copper, there is a UL set, and that's 10 milligrams per day, so that's 10,000 micrograms per day. And as far as the needs go, it varies, but most adults need somewhere between, most non-pregnant adults need 900 micrograms a day, and those needs go up slightly during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Zinc is the next trace mineral, and that's essential for growth and development. Zinc that comes from animal foods is better absorbed than the zinc that comes from plant sources. Remember, because there's compounds in certain plant foods that reduce mineral bioavailability. Compounds like phytates, which we find in whole grains, can reduce the bioavailability of zinc. Zinc is involved in over 300 enzyme reactions. Zinc deficiency can lead to what's called sexual immaturity. And this is a very well-known picture. It's of two people in Egypt. Both are 17 years old. However, the boy slash man on the left-hand side is only four feet tall, which is the height of a seven-year-old in the U.S. His reproductive organs are like those of a six-year-old. This growth retardation is, slight, is ascribed to the fact that he was deficient in zinc. This is a photo taken of two men in Egypt. The one on the left, again, is zinc deficient. Zinc deficiency leads to hypogonadism, which is underdevelopment of the male reproductive organs, dwarfism, as well as problems with wound healing. And we tend to see zinc deficiency in the developing world in diets that don't contain any zinc, but it's also prevalent in malabsorptive GI conditions like Crohn's. As far as the needs go, zinc for adults is anywhere between 8 to 11 milligrams per day. In excess, too much zinc can displace copper and produce copper deficiency anemia. The toxicity symptoms of zinc excess include vomiting, diarrhea, fever, exhaustion, as well as potential fatality. Okay, there's the upper limit for zinc. Look it up for you here. The upper limit for zinc is set at 40 milligrams per day. Where do we find zinc in the diet? Well, it's widespread, but especially in protein foods. You can see things like beef and crab, lentils, nuts, and seeds. Dairy foods also contain zinc and they're slightly less in plant foods, like whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Our next trace mineral is selenium. Selenium is important because it assists glutathione peroxidase, which chemically converts dangerous peroxides into water in your body. Selenium also plays a role in sparing the use of vitamin E, so having adequate selenium in your diet will preserve vitamin E and allow it to do its job. Selenium plays a role in cell membrane integrity. It activates your thyroid hormone and has immune function properties. One important thing to notice or note about one of the functions of selenium is that selenium is the mineral that has antioxidant capacity. So we learned about how vitamins A, C, and E have antioxidant properties, but selenium is a mineral that also has antioxidant properties. Selenium deficiency has been linked to certain types of cancer, like prostate cancer. 
It can cause muscle pain and wasting as well as heart damage. If you eat foods that come from areas where the selenium content of the soil is low, then that could cause selenium deficiency. In China's Kaishan province, it's well known that the soil there has low selenium content. So if people were to eat only foods from that area, they are at higher risk of developing selenium deficiency. In the U.S., the reality is we get most of our food from soil that come from all over the U.S., maybe even all over the world. So the selenium content varies. Selenium, again, has antioxidant properties. As far as selenium excess goes, toxicity has not been reported from food sources. There is a UL set for selenium at 400 micrograms, and you're only going to achieve that if you supplement for long periods of time, which can be toxic to the body. Toxicity symptoms include things like loss of hair, weakness, as well as cirrhosis of the liver. Where do we find selenium? Well, selenium comes in foods that have been harvested from areas where the selenium content of the soil is high. Also foods like Brazil nuts, fish, meat and organ meats, shellfish and eggs contain selenium. And then some grains and seeds that are grown in selenium rich soil may also have selenium. Fluoride. Fluoride is a trace mineral that helps prevent dental caries, which are simply cavities. Fluoride contributes to the strength of your tooth structure. It helps your body resist bacterial acid degradation. It stimulates the remineralization of enamel. And it produces an antibacterial effect of acid-producing organisms that are found in your enamel. So overall, fluoride decreases your risk of dental caries or cavities. If you were to be deficient in fluoride, that would increase the risk of dental caries. Here's a picture of dental caries. There is a UL set for kids, it's 0.1 milligrams per day. And for those over age nine, it's 10 milligrams per day. The fluoride excess condition is called fluorosis, and that can occur if kids take in too much toothpaste. So kids are encouraged to have only pea-sized amounts of toothpaste because that will help to reduce their risk of fluorosis. Fluorosis can permanently damage teeth, which leads to pitted and stained teeth. And actually, the picture you see here is not of dental caries, but of fluorosis. So the recommendation for kids is to use pea-sized portion of toothpaste and don't swallow toothpaste. Dietary sources of fluoride, for most people, it's going to be the fluoride in the water. If you live in an area in the United States where your municipal water supply is fluoridated. But also things like marine fish, clams, lobster, shrimp, tea, and seaweed can also contain fluoride. Fluoridated municipal water sources will have fluoride, but bottled water usually does not. Some natural water sources may. Okay, how much fluoride do you need? One cup of fluoridated water is 0.25 milligrams per cup, and there's no RDA, there's just an AI set for fluoride. This level will help prevent dental caries without increasing the risk of ill effects. Our last micronutrient that we'll look at is iodine. Three quarters of the iodine in your body is found in your thyroid gland. That's where your thyroid hormones are produced. Your thyroid hormones are responsible for regulating metabolism, growth, and promoting protein synthesis. The amount of iodine in the foods will depend on the soil content where plants are grown or where animals graze. The closer you live to the ocean, it's more likely that the foods harvested there will have higher levels of iodine. But to be honest, in the developing world, the primary source, actually throughout the world, even in, in the developed and developing world, the primary source of, so, of iodine is going to be what's called iodized salt. As a public health initiative, many countries iodize their salt as a way to help prevent against goiter and cretinism. Goiter is the physical enlargement of your thyroid gland. I'll show you a picture in the next slide, but the gland enlarges as it tries to trap the passing iodine. Now, goiter can also be a sign of too much or too little iodine, although more often than not, it's occurred or caused by too little iodine. There's also a type of iodine deficiency that causes a form of irreversible mental retardation called cretinism. If a mom is iodine deficient during pregnancy, her baby is at risk of developing cretinism, which is this form of mental retardation. 
So regular goiter is reversible with iodine supplementation. If you have iodized salt as a primary type of salt in your diet, you won't get goiter or won't have cretinism. Iodine deficiency, or iodine excess rather, is rare. Okay, you can get a goiter from having too much iodine as well. Okay. There is an upper limit set for iodine, and it's 1,100 micrograms per day. This last photo here is showing you a picture of a person who has a goiter on the left, and on the right you see a younger as well as an older person that have cretinism, which is that irreversible form of mental retardation that is caused by pregnant moms who are deficient in iodine.